So good morning, everybody. I'm absolutely delighted to be here for so many different reasons. Um, we obviously were worried that we wouldn't be able to do our Future You on the road events uh, this year, but through the, um, the wonder that is uh, Microsoft Teams and all the other virtual things, we, are to, we have been taking I, the ITT Future You uh, programme out on the road. And this is our very first one of this academic year. So we're absolutely delighted to be here. Um, so a little bit about me. Um, Lisa mentioned that I, yes, I am indeed uh, a director and the chair of um, education and training at the Institute of Travel and Tourism. But I actually have a day job. Um, so I am an HR and talent professional and I work with many different businesses across the tourism sp um, spectrum. I work with airlines, OTAs, tour operators, finance companies, um, travel agencies, associations organizations, tourist boards, um, you know, and startups, a whole range of things. So I have recruited many, many people in the many years that I have been working within this fabulous travel and tourism industry that we all love. Um, I also am the UK director for the Global Travel and Tourism Partnership, which is an NGO and it's a multi-country educational program designed to introduce travel and tourism into the curriculum and the opportunities of travel and tourism in the those countries where the tourism industry is an increasingly important part of their local economy and a job creator. So we currently work across 17 countries and there are directors in each of the countries. So that's another passion of mine is to be working globally on talent. Um, so carrying swiftly on, 2020, wow. I mean, you know, don't have to tell any of you what a difficult year this has been for so many different people. Um, we started off the year with lots of excitement, lots of plans for ITT Future U. Many young people, yourself, including yourselves, were thinking about next stages in either their, uh, their education or even work experience. And unfortunately, with the outset of coronavirus, that changed fundamentally for so many people. Um, and we know for a fact that um, by, by April, over 60% of graduate and work experience placements had actually been withdrawn, which was pretty tough for many, many people. Um, Tourism, though, remains an amazing industry. And whilst we're going through a bit of a blip at the moment, we will still have many opportunities for people in the future. The WTTC recently reported that over the last five years, one in four jobs created, created were in travel and tourism. And we already know that 10 jobs globally is um, actually are made up in the tourism space. So it was even predicted that by, 20, by 2030, 14 million jobs would be difficult to actually fill and there'd be an, a shortfall in that. So we've always wanted to encourage lots of young people and new talent into our sector. And that will remain the case when travel comes back. It will come back very quickly. And you will hear that, I'm sure, from a lot of our speakers today. It remains one of the biggest sectors in the world, contributing more than 10% to global domestic product. So it really is an exciting, vibrant industry and one that you will hear again from all our speakers. We're already passionate about. So um, I think there are some people who need to mute their microphone. So can I just remind people that they need to do that, please? Um, it's been tough this year, rising unemployment, particularly with younger people, um, have given you all the name Generation COVID. Um, and many seasoned travel and tourism professionals are currently um, sadly out of work or on furlough. However, this means that many companies are already looking to the future to ensure that we have the talent. I don't know, can someone make it? Yes. Can I ask people to keep their mics off, please? Um, uh, 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 sorry, that, that uh, threw me. Um, so it means that uh, many tourism companies are already looking towards their future talent requirements. So again, please take um, the optimistic but realistic optimistic message that there will be lots of opportunities and continue to be opportunities in the sector. It might just look a little bit different and some of the skills might be a little bit different, but again, we'll be discussing those later on throughout the morning. So
it's just as important now that we do what we can to nurture and attract talent. Um, so we're starting to recover, we're starting to rebuild. We've had some very exciting um, sort of potential vaccines announced in the last couple of weeks. And this is all about creating confidence and getting people moving again. And that's what we need. That's what we need in our sector. And there are so many opportunities in our sector. And this morning you will hear from a number of different people who actually cover different areas of the sector. So again, that will give you a, a kind of an, a taste of some of the many opportunities that await, await you. So I'm really delighted to be here this morning. Um, I'm very pleased that we've got such amazing lineup of speakers for you. And I would like to start um, in a minute by introducing uh, Steve Endicott. Now, Steve is um, an ITT board director alongside myself. He was nominated, he came onto the board just last year. This is a pre recorded video, so um, we might take a little bit of, of time to get going. And once we've heard from Steve, I'll come back and tell you a little bit more about some of the stuff that we've got planned for future you over the next uh, few months and, uh, and going forward. So Lisa, any chance we can get the Steve video going? Hi Claire, it's Victoria. Oh, hi Victoria. I think she might still be um, on the phone to IT, so if maybe we could move to the next speaker. Well, yeah. Victoria. Oh, it's no, she's okay. here. Sorry, I'm Fantastic. here. It's okay, just bear with me a second, just setting it up. Brilliant. Could someone let me know whether they can see the screen? I can see it. Oh, now. Victoria, can you let me know whether you can see the screen? Um, I can't at the moment, no, sorry. Okay. Lisa, mm -hmm. do you want me to carry on just talking a bit more about Future You whilst you do this? Yes, why not? I'll okay. be working away in the background. All right, that's great. So we, we love... Um... Oh. We love a bit of technology, don't we? Um, OK, so... I'm hoping you'll be able to see my slides again in a sec. So yeah, so I told you um, a bit about me um, and where we're at now in 2020. But um, interestingly enough, what has happened in 2020 is it actually has enabled us to really start to develop Future You to make sure that we can take advantage of this new virtual world that we're all living in, much as we are very keen to get back to our face to face. And we have every intention of carrying on with our face to face um, roadshows when we're allowed to do it. So what's coming up and what's been happening with, um, with IT Future U since the beginning of this year is that we had our annual student awards as we always have done. Unfortunately, because of COVID, we weren't able to have our big presentation party, which takes place at our summer party in London every summer at the House of Parliament. So we're hoping, fingers crossed, that um, we'll be able to actually have an even bigger ceremony next year um, in July at the House of Parliament and we will have last year's winners, also this year's winners, 2020 winners and the winners for this next year. And so I wanted to let you all know that our awards are now open and that um, you can get all that information by visiting the 
the Future You website. Now, the Future You website, which I'll, I'll give you in a sec, is, is ittfutureyou.co.uk. So that's nice and easy. And I do urge people to have a go and, um, and actually enter. It's an amazing opportunity for the people who do win it. As I said, you get to come down to London for an amazing evening with lots of very senior industry people and, um, and a network um, with your peers um, as well. So I please do urge you to have a look at those awards. As I said, today's our first of our virtual road Ooh. shows, which has been fantastic um, and really looking forward to the rest of today. And we'll be doing more and more of these over the coming months until we can, as I say, get back out on the road for real. In July, we had our very first international careers conference which actually was a huge success we had a full day we had over 60 presenters we had over 36 different countries from around the world take part and over 3,000 people visiting us over four different platforms all of those um, individual sessions are still available on our very own YouTube channel, which we launched at the same time. So I do recommend that you have a visit and have a look at our YouTube. There's all sorts of information, some of it specifically aimed at students. And we also have a number of other things on there, including um, spotlight interviews and one-to-one -one interviews with many different people from across the sector again giving you a flavor and giving you a sense of of the different types of roles that we have and the people's own advice and how they got there so some really really great things on there and we call those our spotlight on and we're also um, delighted that we managed to um, ha have our very first future you apprentice ambassador um, appointed this year chloe who i believe is actually with us this morning um, joined us in in the summer and she is actually responsible for putting together a lot of our video content on our future you youtube channel so and and working with the social media and what chloe will be doing in coming in months is also working with the itt student ambassadors now we have some great ambassadors um, at leeds who are all with us today um, who have been helping us and they will be working as i said with chloe and with other student ambassadors around the country to help inform you guys and be the voice of, of the student population back to the ITT so that we know what we are delivering is something that you want to hear from us. So what is ITT Future U? Well, we started it 2009 at World Travel Market. It's become the annual travel student conference there. We have over 500 people attending annually. Unfortunately, obviously this year, we weren't able to do it. But the whole point of ITT Future U is to give you an insight into our fantastic sector, to give you some ideas, hopefully inspire you about all the different opportunities, get some tips, learn from our mistakes. Oh, and someone else has started sharing. So hi, Claire. I think it's Adam. He's um, joined the meeting to try ah, and play the video just to keep brilliant. you posted. Great stuff. Yeah, we're ready for the video if you want. Oh, fantastic. Well, welcome, Steve Endicott. Then. Thank you, Adam. Hey, that would be great. My name is Ian Brooks, and I've been a member of the ITT for about twenty years. Uh, which is about as long as I've known my friend oh. Steve Endicott, who I'm going to interview today. Uh, for the ITT and their Future You program. So, Steve, uh, why don't we start off uh, as as we're talking to students? Uh, why don't we start off and, and ask you about uh, your education and qualifications? I, I'm not sure. Did you have an education? Do you have any qualifications? Your cheeky bugger, Brooksy. Uh, yeah, O levels, A levels, degree, uh, accountancy. Uh, never want to be an accountant. Just want to be rich. Uh, came from a working class family, saw my dad working hard and said, not doing that. Uh, and accountancy in those days was a fast track into management. So I did an accountancy degree and then stumbled into travel, God, in the early 80s. So over 35 years ago for International Leisure Group. And I was quite successful because I was a young accountant that understood if you charged everything back to other divisions, you look profitable. And that made you um, very popular and you got promoted. So worked there until about 25 when uh, a guy called Peter Long, then just recently left the industry, he offered me the um, finance directorship of Intersub, one of their major brands. Um, so I went home, talked to the then uh, fiance and said, you know what, instead of buying that house and getting engaged and getting married, why don't we just go back around the world? So I ended up going back next day and resigning and saying, sorry, it's not what I want to do just yet. I'll take a year out. 
Uh, and I took a year out and I came back and lo and behold, I got the same job with better pay a year later. And Steve, just on, on that, you know, kind of you did like a, what I call a, um, a, a late gap year, uh, which, which, which are, are quite popular these days, although very difficult to have around the world right now. Uh, but is that something that you would advise? Is that, did that, you know, help shape your career? Did you come back a different person after a year of traveling? It was one of the best years of my life. That's the most fun. Um, no, being serious, I actually do think it made me grow up an awful lot, made me a lot more independent, probably a lot more of a risk taker because, you know, I was used to getting on a plane, landing in the country and I had no idea what I was going to do. Uh, and that's a great experience you, you don't normally get in life. So, yeah, no, it made me more ballsy. Uh, and that's probably demonstrated, actually, when I went back to um, RLG or into some, because it only lasted four days before it went bust due to the <laughs> Gulf War. Um, it's a bit like COVID, basically, it happened overnight. Gulf War, oil prices went through the roof, demand for travel went through the floor, uh, and the company collapsed. And I, I had the experience. Well. <laughs> well, I think you were there, actually, mate. I was, I was there. I remember getting up uh, to have my breakfast, turning on the TV, and they said all the Air Europe aircraft have been grounded. And I thought, oh, I don't think I'll be going to work today. Well, unfortunately, I did, because I had to do the business plans to start a new business. Um, called Sunworld, which is yeah, it's gone and buried now, but it was an interesting experience. Um, opening a new office, getting computers, starting from scratch, doing the business plans over the weekend. Even coming up the name, it came from the, the Sun and the News of the World, because there were two papers on the table when the guys was trying to come up with a name, and it came up with Sunworld. No way! Really? Yeah, colour kind of scheme and everything, just nicked it from the Sun. There you go. So um, did Sunworld for a while, and then got seduced, God knows how, actually, by David Crossland to go up to Air Tours. So yep. I, I took a cutting car, cut and pay, moved to the north of England, all because I believed this guy was on the right track and would build a successful company. And we used to boast about when we joined Air Tours, and I joined in 91 when it was just started with airline. Uh, and then we used to boast about when we left because it's a huge, largest tour operator in the world by then. And now we don't really boast at, at all because it all went horribly wrong at the end. But I had a lovely career there uh, until, oh, 98. And then I got seduced and had a year in the garden. Uh, that's where they pay you for doing nothing, Crooks, because they don't want you to work for a competitor. What a lovely concept. If only that could be, well, I suppose the government is doing that at the moment. That sounds like furlough to me, Steve. It was a, a, an early version of furlough. Yeah, you sit in the garden for a year. I think the difference is you know you've got a job at the end of it. Yeah. So that probably helps compared yeah. with most furlough people's situations, unfortunately. Um, and basically, I went off to the States at that point, to America. Uh, just as the dot-com boom was happening. I loved America, my wife hated it, and she said, new job, a new wife, and being quite ugly, I thought I'd better go and get a new job. So I came back to the UK, and instead of going to the corporate life, um, I'd made enough money out of that deal to be really well set up, house paid for, et cetera, and that allows you to gamble a little bit. So I set up um, free businesses, uh, holiday taxis, rock insurance, CWT, four businesses, sorry, and a call centre called Holidays by Phone and built those for three years uh, until I got seduced, would you believe, to go back to corporate life? David Crossan came knocking on the door with a huge pay packet and a big ego boost, because he asked me to be chief operating officer, running going places, air tours, and um, the online uh, business. So I went back there to corporate life and absolutely hated it. Because having been out of it for a while, and they were in financial distress anyway, we ended up selling the business on to Thomas Cook. But it's quite major financial stress, and I hated it. So I did that for just over a year. I uh, had to write off. I remember, I remember you million. burning brochures in a in, in a in a tin dustbin. Uh, that was um, Lucy from then at TTG Now Travel Weekly. Uh, upset me by mounting the My Travel logo, so I called her up from London and said, "I'll mount your bloody logo," and burnt all the magazines for that week uh, in front of all the staff, which. Some staff love, some staff hated, but it's how I felt about it. So that's what happened. Um, um, started my own businesses again after leaving my travel uh, and eventually sold um, holiday taxis last year for 60.5 million. I didn't get all that money, a lot of it, which was good. Oh, there's the mysteries coming in now. That's what happens in Zoom calls. Hi, Ruth. Uh, yeah, a bit late. She's gone. Um, so broadly, that's my career. There you go. So, 
What I'm really interested in is um, is, is the, the move back and forth in the corporate world and and having your own businesses. And it's very interesting. You you went back and then said you hated it. Do you think once you've got a taste for having your own business, it's it's very hard to sort of to go back into that corporate world? Yes and no. Actually, I don't think that was a big issue. I think. I don't think you should start your own business until you've worked in the corporate world because you learn so much. It's so useful when yeah. you're doing your own business, how to manage people properly, how to do legal structures, how to do accounts, etc. What I hated when I went back was basically not getting to your desk for the first afternoon because you get on a Monday and you're meeting after meeting after meeting after meeting. And it's quite difficult to feel like you're getting anywhere when you're running such a huge organisation. Yeah. Uh, and also I was away from home. It was financially stressful. It just wasn't great for my life. Um, so I took a decision that, you know what, I don't need this. and I'm not going to do it. Fair enough. So let's talk about um, sort of fast forward to uh, the current situation. Uh, how bad is the travel industry right now? I mean, it's uh, it's been it's been tough, right? Book see, 35 years in the industry. And I think you're similar. It's never been worse. Yep. So we've had Gulf Wars, we've had Ash Cloud, we've never had complete, utter grind to a halt once with the first lockdown and then again with the second lockdown. I'm very concerned for the major airlines. Basically, the bigger you are in these times, the harder you fall because the more losses you're incurring and you're creating great big debt mountains. I don't think the airlines will go bust, but I think their shareholders are probably going to get diluted very heavily as we come out of it and they turn the debt into equity. And thousands upon thousands of our colleagues in the travel industry are losing jobs. And if you're out there and you're a travel tourism student at the moment, bluntly, don't even bother looking for a job for six months until yeah. things pick up. And they will pick up. But in the next six months, it's never going to be tougher. Don't get depressed. There's not much out there. If you have to work in other sectors, as well, take those work, take that work. It will come back. But this summer is going to be an ultra late market. Yeah. Basically, if you're a customer, look, we know there's a vaccine coming. But we don't know how half passports work yet. We don't know when you're going to the Canaries, for example, you need to test 72 hours before. And lovely boots are charged 120 quid each, which I've protested about, by the way. Um, so we don't really know how some is going to work. But I do guarantee that there's no incentive for customers to book in January. They're going to wait and see. And I think the vaccine will come. I think the testing will come. I think demand will be very late this summer. But the good news is the year after, capacity will be lower and demand will be extremely strong because people didn't get their 2020 holiday, may not got the 21 holiday and will definitely go away in 22. And that this summer and then this start of next year is why I think it will come back to the industry. But it's tough. And what about, because, um, you know, we, we used to talk a lot about Brexit and, and the impact on the travel industry. It's kind of got left behind uh, with the pandemic, but um, it, I mean, it's going to happen in uh, in about six weeks time. So what, what what's the impact of Brexit going to be? Brooksy, you're trying to depress me because, <laughs> well, we've got lockdown coming and we know Brexit is going to be very damaging and passports and overseas worker roles and be restricted, uh, six freedom flying rights, uncertain. Basically, Brexit was a disaster that's only been taken over. I'm not going to laugh, it's taken over by COVID. Uh, and then we've also got recession coming because we haven't seen recession yet. We're in furlough, things are traditionally being held up. Um, but it is going to get tough out there in the next couple of years. Blunt is a bit like after the war years. Yeah, everybody said, oh, it'll be over by Christmas. It isn't. And the same as COVID. It's going to go on and the knock on will be several years. But Let's not be all depressed because most companies already slashed back their overhead so much that yeah. the only route forward is expansion. And if you have a choice of young people where you can get subsidies from the government to take them on, bluntly they're cheaper, uh, they're more enthusiastic, they're hardworking, they're better tuned with technology. I know I would employ a younger workforce as I expand rather than taking on the dead wood that it, I wouldn't have got rid of quite bluntly if it wasn't for COVID. Getting yeah. rid of people once we've worked with them for many years is really hard, even though yeah. they're probably not the right people for the job anymore. They've gone. So all companies need to take a startup mentality, nimble on the feet, quick and agile, and that tends to be younger people with better education, better
better training and better knowledge of social media and other tools. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, one thing's been clear about this pandemic is it's fast forwarded the, the digital transformation for, for travel companies. And, um, you know, they're not, they're not burning bro brochures anymore. They're just, they're just not printing them, uh, are they? And I think, uh, I think you're absolutely right in terms of the management. It's, it's, it's younger people have a much more natural grasp of, of social media and the digital platforms. I'll give you another example. Um, it's like, yes, the high street has been heavily damaged at the moment and lots of high street agencies will never open again. However, Zoom could be the saviour for the travel industry because imagine in the past you're a specialist in the Caribbean as a high street agent, yeah? You have to yeah. rely on walking traffic or people in that area. Now via Zoom, you can have yeah one-on-one -on -one visual conversations. Yeah, a voice phone call now is no longer good enough. I don't know about you, but when I call my mates, I always have them on FaceTime or have them on Zoom because yeah. I want to see him as well as actually just that's a big shift to us old kids. Not holding your phone to your ear. Look, my phone is in front of me in a holder and I'm talking yeah. to the phone. Yeah, that's a big shift that's happened massively fast over COVID. Yeah. Um, home workings will boom, um, high street will die. But loads of people won't go back to full online booking because of the impact of COVID again. So again, there will be a role for younger people who understand visual content, understand videos, understand how to use Zoom or Teams or whatever to come into the marketplace. If things are changing, things are changing fast. And, and if you're a Caribbean uh, specialist, I mean, why not base yourself in the Caribbean and, and take your bookings from there, right? Uh, more logically, why don't you go and work in Spain and live in Spain but up in the UK? Now, being yeah. seriously, you don't... Offices are dead, yeah. Yes, you will have a new version of the office, which will be the social environment where you're going to have coffee or you're going to have beers, etc., and you meet your colleagues and you socialise. But sitting at a desk, when you can sit at the same desk at home and do the same work, that's gone. You don't need an office for that anymore. And that's great for younger people, to be fair. I, I wish I had that because... That's a better work-life balance. That's less rubbish commuting. Yeah, as long as you actually make, don't get isolated, which is always a fear of yeah. working from home. Yeah. So, what what would you say to um, uh, the, the 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 students that, that are looking at the travel industry? I mean, would you say um, find another industry, or would you would you say it's more of a timing issue? Would you say come and join this great industry, but but maybe not quite yet? It's timing, mate. You've, you've just summed it up. Yeah, we've, I've had 35 years in an industry where everybody else says, oh, you work in the travel industry, you go overseas all the time. And it's like, well, no, you don't. I used to have an office in Mallorca where I used to sit in the office rather than be on holiday. But you get lots of perks. If you can wait for your freebies or a few upgrades, like get out of the industry now, you shouldn't be in it. So there are a lot of benefits to be had. It's an interesting thing to talk about. It's an interesting job. Uh, no, I wouldn't say don't come. I'd say it's going to be hard to get in for a while. So make sure you've got a backup option in the short term, but it'll be booming again. I think it'll be a good time to get in. Yeah, good. Now, Steve, be before we finish, um, I, I'm, I'd like you just to, to talk to uh, talk to students about some of the things you've been doing since, since the pandemic started, because uh, you, obviously the pandemic caused a lot of dis disruption. And you've been investing and uh, coming up with quite a few new ideas and new business concepts and uh, quite a few of them not even in travel. So, um, uh, you know, we'd love to hear a little bit more about those. I'm a bit worried, actually, that I'm getting like, too engaged and working too hard. Um, I've always had what I call an idea shelf uh, and I never take an idea off the shelf until I get a management team because without the team to actually deliver it, it is wasting your time. But in the COVID world, there's just loads of good people about. So I get all excited and I just sort of go and do shit. So I'll give you a few examples. Uh, my hot tub outside is sitting in the morning. So second week of COVID, I went face mask. Okay, there's going to be a massive need for face mask. Where can I from? So I went and found a supplier in Thailand. I went and guy got a guy called Eddie Rob who's working on another project and said, can you be MD of it? Uh, and we sold 500,000 by going B2B wow. to um, Jet2 airlines, to travel agencies, to pub chains, to restaurants, and to saying, do you want branded, black, blue, red, logoed face masks? Quick, easy, dirty, um, good money. Um, we launched Q, which was uh, failed, by the way, 
completely failed, but hey, you've got to try these things. It was an app to fast track um, access to shops and like Disney's Fast Pass, a bit like EasyJet, Speedy yeah. Boarding, and it failed because the queues didn't materialize because people didn't go out. Oops. So, you know what? Bin it, chuck it away. Don't spend more time on it. Move on to the next one. Um, the next one was WAR, uh, working at home solutions. So, we're now importing um, really flashy garden offices because it's tax efficient and the company can pay for them and put in people's homes because now more people are working from home quite often. You've got two people in, in the uh, house, like Ruth is popping in to get the, the printer when I'm on a call. Yeah, it's just, that's what it's like. It's chaotic. So trying to smooth that out by having a second office makes sense and it's tax efficient. Uh, lastly, we're launching a major FX business called Canny Finance because I've got Jane Atkins um, to come as MD there. And that's about just saying to people, instead of using your debit credit, debit or credit card overseas, swap it to this card, uh, a canny card, and you get 3% cash back. Nice. Because the banks are ripping the arse out of you. So yeah. we'll take a high markup, but we'll give you 3% of it back. Uh, uh, and then we use the data lake of travel because travel companies know exactly who's going on holiday. So you only target those people with social media, email, messages for the four weeks before they go. And then you target them to load when the results because you know exactly where they are. So data has a lot of data and information. Has a lot of data and information yeah. that we tend to waste, and I'm going to make sure we don't. So that's just three examples. I've invested in other businesses. Um, content gym guy came to me with a very good idea about um, bringing SEO specialists and content writers and social media tools together, uh, and basically having a management team to offer them out as one product to people, but having different companies underneath. I liked it, I backed it. Um, Holly Bob, which is a venture tour aggregator, liked it, backed it. Sound Travel, uh, liked it, it's going horribly wrong. Sound Travel has an exclusive um, agreement with Ticketmaster to package up any music event and any sporting event with accommodation. What a great contract. Unless nobody's going to any events and any <laughs> concerts, and then it's a bit more difficult. But basically, like most things, you just batten down hatches, right out the stall, furlough, and hope it comes back. Yeah, absolutely. So, in 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 terms of you know throughout all your all your years and all the different businesses that you you've had and the experiences you've had, corporate, non corporate, what sort of what what recommendations, what sort of key key learnings would you say um, you've had for, from all that experience that you can pass on to to these these new uh, graduates that are going to join our industry, hopefully. I'm glad you leave the easy questions to last. Jesus, Brooks. Uh, okay, so what did I learn? Probably the biggest one, most important one, was when I was young. I'm still a cocky cop shite now, I know. But when I was young, uh, and one of my bosses, a uh, guy called George Marvin, sent me on a course. And on this course, they made you draw a circle where you're in the middle. And then draw circles around that for your other people that work with you. And then write in those circles how they see you. It wasn't a pleasant exercise. It made me realise they probably didn't like me that much. And you have a wake-up call. And the wake-up call is you've got to work as a team and you've got to bring people with you. And if you're a cocky gobshite, they ain't going to support you. So I changed. And that was probably a big part of me then reaching further heights. The second part of reaching further heights is always have better people underneath you. Yeah. Find those brighter people. Don't be scared if they're brighter than you. That's great. Because they do the work and they get you promoted. I think having not great people on TV is a disaster area. Don't do it. Which brings on to probably the same point, the relevant is everybody talks about managing teams, which is really important. And yeah, I won't say don't do it because you've got to focus on 60% of your time managing down your team. But don't forget to spend 40% of your time managing up. Because if your bosses don't know how good a job you're doing, you ain't going to get promoted. And if you want to get on with your career, you've got to do both directions and focus on communicating clearly to your boss what you've achieved, what you haven't achieved, why you haven't achieved the bits that they wanted you to achieve. So you don't get the blame, you get the understanding. Um, so I think they're really important lessons. The last one is understand what you're good at. Right? When you get more senior, you need to know what is your core strength and what is your core weakness. Yeah. And make sure you've got something next year that deals with the core weakness because then it counterbalances and you can do anything you like, but we can't all be good at everything. Yeah. Um, lastly, most importantly, 
don't forget, you're going to die. And I don't say that just for depression. It's like, if you don't enjoy your life as you go along, you're wasting years. And I did some jobs, um, like going back to um, Air Tours My Travel, Corporate Life, where if you don't like it, get out. Don't do it. Because yeah, you're going to die. Uh, and for me now, my whole mantra is I'm now over 50, so I should be spending more than I'm earning because I ain't going to keep taking it to the grave. So I'm going to have a bloody good time, thanks. Um, so last lesson, work hard, play hard, enjoy your job. If you don't enjoy it, go and find another one. I like that, Steve. And um, you're certainly somebody who uh, lives by the mantra. Um, but it was, it's been a pleasure uh, interviewing you today. And hopefully uh, you've encouraged people to to come and join our wonderful industry, uh, but perhaps not until next summer. <laughs> Thanks, Brooks, podcast. And by the way, if you want a job, yes, we do have some. So get in touch with IT team, we'll work it out. And if you want to hear some interesting podcasts, listen to Brooksy, because he's got some very good points to make. Thank you very much, guys. See you soon. Cheers, Steve. Bye. Well, I have to say um, a, a huge thank you to uh, to Steve and to Ian Brooks, um, both of whom are fantastic supporters of the ITT and both very passionate about uh, future talent and emerging talent. So um, I always enjoy listening to Steve. He is one of industry's characters, that's for sure. But as you can see, also a serial entrepreneur and someone who always looks for opportunity out of any crises. So fairly blunt messaging them, but I think also some very optimistic ones. And I hope you enjoyed that. So coming up next is um, my good friend, Ben Rogers. Um, ben is one of ITT Future U's ambassadors, um, and that is largely due to the fact that he's been an amazing supporter of ours over the last few years. Um, ben is the sales manager for Best Western Hotels, um, but has had a very long and um, interesting career to date within the industry. So he's here to share his story so far and give you some um, information around the hospitality industry. So Ben, I'm hoping you are there and ready to go. I am Claire. Um, very good morning. And uh, as ever, it's nice to be virtually back at Leeds. Um, uh, good morning to everyone and to um, yeah to everyone that's dialing in from wherever that may be. Um, it is a very cold, rainy day here in Liverpool, um, and I'm here in the spare room with the dog, which is where I've been working for the last few months. Um, I've uh, I've agreed to bring back my uh, professional life story um, as it was and to tell you about how I got to where I am. Um, and then obviously, um, if anyone's got any questions throughout, pop them in the chat. Um, uh, I do have to dive off uh, shortly after I've presented, um, uh, but I will try and get back for the panel question and answer later. Um, if I don't manage to get back for that, please do reach out to me on LinkedIn. Um, I'm just going to attempt to share my screen. Um, and I've absolutely lost count of the amount of times that I've said that so far since returning to work from, uh, from furlough. Um, let's just take a look. OK, let's try. And it might be that Adam needs to release the Microsoft Stream video that we were playing. That might look more promising for you, hopefully. OK, one sec. Whilst whilst you're doing that, Ben, um, uh, just to just to reiterate what you just said about using the chat facility, we've had a couple of comments in there already, which um, we will um, respond to. And actually, um, I might respond to the one at the moment um, and agree with uh, the comment that Anne Marie made around homeworking. Um, 
there, there is no doubt that there has obviously um, going to be an increase in requests to work from home. But what most companies are doing is looking at creating a proper flexible working environment whereby people will probably stagger the time that they spend in the office and the time they spend at home. As I mentioned, I work with a lot of different companies and, and there is a real appetite from many of the people who um, work there already for coming back into the office. People miss their colleagues. They miss the chats over the coffee in the in the um, in the kitchens and going out and just you know going out to lunch and 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 we have a very sociable industry in, in travel and tourism and hospitality and so that's certainly not going to go away it's a very um, important point though and um, one thing that this whole pandemic has allowed and one thing that there's been an awful lot of talk about across all the media channels is the need to build back better and we see that written everywhere but sustainable and responsible practices both in in tourism and in the tourism departments and companies is something that will increase and something that I'm very focused on as are many of my other HR colleagues. So with that I can see we've got Ben's, um, Ben's <laughs> stuff up so I'm going to leave it <laughs> leave it with that and over to you Ben. Thank you, Claire. Um, so as you can see, uh, here we have um, a little bit of, of the start of my journey. So I I began my uh, my life my life in travel and in hospitality um, overseas. You can tell by the fetching turquoise and pink uniform um, that I was a first choice holiday rep back in the day. This was prior to the merger with TUI. Um, and uh, some of me and some of my fellow colleagues and some holiday makers there um, in our in our beautiful bright polo shirts. Um, I didn't always want to go into the industry. I actually began um, I began my my career um, by heading off to university uh, to study performing arts, um, and I kind of fell into it. Um, so I I got my degree um, from Winchester. And um, I needed something, um, sort of a, a net. I'd realised pretty much uh, throughout my career, uh, sorry, throughout my time at university that I, I really, well, basically, I really wasn't going to be a star. I wasn't going to, I wasn't going to be famous. Uh, I probably wasn't good enough to to make it uh, through doing the audition processes. And um, this was way back before the days of reality television. So you needed more than a hair, a hair dryer, uh, sorry, a hairbrush to sing into in a sob story. Um, to make it on the X Factor, so I thought, you know what, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna go back to university, and, and I'm gonna get my post grad, and I'm gonna become a teacher. So I did, um, I did the application form. I uh, was accepted for a place. Um, however, I needed something between what I was doing at the time, um, and and also sort of heading back to university. So I decided that I would go off and see the world a little bit, and head off to be a holiday rep. So I filled in a couple of applications. Um, first choice came back to me very, very quickly and invited me for interview. And I remember uh, going for my interview down at Gatwick um, at Jet Set House. Um, and it was the day after Valentine's Day. So I turned up um, a group interview, about 40 people, and we uh, had to sell a trip. I remember I had to sell a trip to the moon um, so it was, you know, sort of a real on the spot, tested our presentation skills um, let them know that, you know, we'd be confident in presenting in front of people. And so, yeah, um, got offered the job and very, very quickly um, headed out to resort. I uh, was offered the position on the 20th of February and was out on resort on the 7th of March. So it was a really, really quick process. I decided about halfway through my first uh, halfway through my first season that actually I was I was quite enjoying being a holiday rep and um, so I agreed with with my mum and that I was going to defer my place at, at university to do my postgrad um, for a little while um, so I deferred it for the first year and then deferred it for the next year um, and then went on to defer it um, a third time before she actually said, look, this isn't going to happen, is it? You're, you're not going to be a teacher and and this is where your heart lies. Um, so I did. I stayed uh, stayed out on, on resort for five years and um, worked across eight gateways. 
um, which was 11 different resorts across 12 different seasons, so summer and winter. Um, I saw in and um, personally greeted about 3,900 flights, um, which is pretty amazing. Dealt with about 12,000 guests, drank 24,960 shots of vodka. That's a rough approximation there, um, but uh, sent also about 34,000 text messages. Um, and some very good money at the time, 62,400 euros in commission or thereabouts. Um, however, um, I probably didn't bring much of that home with me um, and figured out that I spent about 1,279,200 minutes at work um, across those five years, but also brought home countless memories. Um, I'm still absolute best friends with some people that I met when I was overseas, people from different parts of the country, people who when I see now, it's as if it's as if nothing's changed. Um, you know, some some really, really strong um friendships for life however after after spending all that time overseas i you know family was moving on things were changing and it was it was really time to head back to the uk um i decided that i would go back and take a retail secondment from first choice um so i went into a first choice travel shop um which then as part of the streamlining of the retail estate and various other things um was going to be was going to be closing. So I went off to Thomas Cook, um, God rest their soul. And uh, I spent um, a good few years with them. Um, I spent a total of four years um, in selling basically package holidays on the high street. Um, I moved into long haul specialism and cruise product specialism. Um, I became assistant manager of the year and also manager of the year. Um, so I worked very, very hard. I discovered very quickly that that selling holidays was something that came very naturally to me. Um, I was able to travel um, extensively during my time in retail. Um, you can see me here. This is on actual Ramsey Street. Um, uh, if anyone still watches Neighbours, I think this house is still in it. But this was my trip to Australia as an Aussie specialist. This was my opportunity to to see the product that I was I was selling um, and to really enjoy, um, you know, going out and, and, and seeing how I could help people's dreams come true. When you're selling holidays, um, when you be it working for a tour operator, be it work in mar working in marketing, be it working as a travel agent, that's essentially what you're doing. You're making promises. You're selling a, quite an emotional product. This could be the holiday where you know, where someone proposes, this could be the first holiday with a child, this could be the last holiday that someone has, you know, with with a parent who who is ill, this could be the big holiday that someone has when they retire, when they finished working, this could be two families coming together, three families coming together, four families coming together, you know, any people go on holiday for any number of reasons and it was that that drew me in it was that that attracted me um i like knowing why people were going somewhere what they wanted to get out of it um and it was that process that drew me towards um working for a long-haul luxury tour operator you know people people wanting once in a lifetime experiences so after my time at thomas kirk and and a little bit of time uh working in operations I went to Kewoni Retail. Um, Kewoni were opening their first stores outside of London. Um, and uh, I went to the first one to open, which was Milton Keynes. Milton Keynes allowed me to um, it allowed me to really understand the tailor-made travel process and taught me a lot about product. Um, it taught me a lot about the research that goes into um, selling a holiday, selling uh, selling a different product in a new way. Uh, Kewoni had done their research extraordinarily well with um, deciding where they were going to open their shops. Um, a little fact about Milton Keynes, um, it's got the highest concentration of national lottery winners. Um, so if you think that, you know, people have got a little bit more disposable income, where better to, op to open a luxury holiday shop? Um, it was a very different retail experience. Kewoni customers are seated. Uh, they're offered a drink of their choice. They're, you know, you're encouraged to, to discuss the holiday with them before you even start looking at prices and brochures to discover why they're traveling, to, to figure out what it is that they want to get out of the experience. 
Um, I was a product specialist in uh, both Austra Australasia and Latin America. Um, and I worked very, very hard for them um, and was top seller for four years. Um, I have an unbroken sales record. Uh, Derek Jones likes to remind me of this when I go to industry events. Um, uh, 1.2 million pounds worth of holiday sales in my um, face to face sales. So that's convincing people um you know that basically they they have to they have to book this q only holiday because it's it's going to be the one that meets their needs best because it's personal to them um i also worked my way into manager um i managed manchester king street um and we were manager of the uh, i was manager of the year um i also worked on the shop of the year team twice uh, once at milton Keynes and once at manchester um so yeah some incredible times there and a lot of hard work a lot of you know throwing myself into it not a lot of weekends um and so um having gained all that experience i decided that i would look at um a different opportunity um a client of mine from Kuoni who had who had a production company at Media City uh, in Manchester, was setting up a new travel brand um, and he asked me to go in as head of travel. Um, Way Out uh, is a company that's still operating um, and it specialises in travel for the production industries. So arranging travel, arranging travel operations for um, film and television shoots, for advertisement production. Um, so it was a combination of not only booking flights and accommodation for crew, but also for talent. It was helping to arrange filming locations, arranging cargo, because obviously cameras weigh a lot. And if you're shipping a camera from one place to another, you need to do that in a certain way. It was, you know, working very flexibly, having to move because of weather and, and different arrangements that were going on. Um, we produced some absolutely amazing work, um, but I realised very, very quickly um, that the startup was not for me. I'm much more comfortable in a more established company um, and I'm much more comfortable in a role that allows me to work within a framework. It's very, very easy when working for a startup um to give them absolutely everything give them all of your time um so my advice on anyone that is planning on on sort of working for an emerging business of which there will be much um in the in the next couple of years um is definitely choose what works for you um you've got to be passionate about what you're doing but it has to go both ways uh, the companies that you're work you're going to work for have to be as passionate about you as you are about them you have to set your limits, be that about your personal time, be that about any finance that, you, that you're going to put in a company or about anything else. Um, and you have to stick to your limits as well. Um, and also know when to walk away. Ultimately, um, as as the speaker before me said, there are times when you will you will realise that actually this is not going to work and you have to walk away. You have to step away and just say, do you know what? No, it's, it's, it's not going to be right. Um, I went into corporate sales uh, following um, my time at Way Out, um, which is the, the corporate travel sector. Um, the business travel sector allows amazing insight into how the world works, into why people are traveling, why people are meeting. Um, I always use as an example a client now that I still deal with. Um, so at the time at a previous UK hotel group, De Vere, um i looked after the english vegetable growers association um they have a conference twice twice a year um and one conference is just for potatoes and one is for all the other vegetables so there'll be a root vegetable section and there'll be a brassica section um but these these two conferences are worth in excess of 1.4 million pounds each um, both in advertising revenue, exhibition revenue, um, money to the hotel, on conference spend, that sort of thing. So that's a huge amount of money every year just to talk about vegetables. Um, it's it's an absolutely amazing. Uh, everything that goes on behind behind the scenes is extraordinary, um, and it really it allows you to gain so much experience of different industries whilst working in what in what you love. Um, 
You will also, throughout your time, um, especially when dealing with corporates, build networks and connections that will build and grow over time. Uh, I've been lucky enough to be approached um, for a couple of positions, a couple of things that I've done by people that I previously worked with. It's how I ended up doing ITT, Future You. Um, you know, I'd, I'd spent some time working at Way Out. I met uh, Danny Wayne, um, who is uh, now head of membership at Avta. Um, and he introduced me to Claire, um, who asked me to be an ITT Future You um, industry ambassador. And it's something that I'm incredibly passionate about. Um, so your network will grow with you. It will come with you over time and you will end up with an address book that is is incredibly valuable and um, you will know people everywhere um, and so that can that can be a huge advantage it can also be a huge disadvantage because inevitably at an industry event you'll have a glass of wine too many and say something slightly controversial and yes that will follow you so my advice is if it is controversial back it up with fact um, or um, just be incredibly nice to people the next day um, you will gain opportunities for growth and development in other areas um, but also you will you will meet so many suppliers so many vendors of different products and things that you will not only will you be able to to work with them on that project or that event but you will carry them with you um, so they will you know they they will be able to help you as much as you you help them so what about now so currently, um, we've got me and some of my industry colleagues here at, at an event last year, um, but currently um, I'm working for Best Western Hotels and Resorts. Um, so Best Western uh, are a membership organisation um, and what hotels do is they join Best Western for sales and distribution purposes. Um, and, from cur and currently we have 307 UK hotels. Uh, Best Western GB is part of a membership network of over 11,000 hotels worldwide and I'm part of a team of four UK sales managers. Um, I deal with the agency market, um, so I deal with business travel agencies, uh, corporate conference agencies, um, travel management companies and the like. Um, we have wide and varied locations for our hotels um, and for our products. Uh, we have 14 brands in the UK. Um, and during national lockdown, um, I'm pleased to say that, that well over two thirds of our hotels remained open and we accommodated NHS key workers uh, for over 27,000 room nights. Uh, we're currently working with uh, the government and the Home Office on a number of relief projects um, where hotels will be turned over to care homes or to people leaving a care setting and um, also to the Home Office for immigration and asylum purposes. Um, and we, you know, we're incredibly proud of the work that we're doing, that we're diversifying, that we're accommodating people in challenging times. Um, and we've also um, very, very recently featured uh, in our own Channel 4 series, um, a very British hotel group. Uh, it highlights what a unique offering Best Western is. Uh, one of the reasons I was so attracted to it is because no two of our hotels are the same. It's not like when you walk into a Hilton and you get the standard welcome. It's not like when you walk into, you know, an Ibis and it's 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 bright and it's basic. We've got everything from boutique brands um, to our sure stay collection, which is, you know, which is hotels of two or three stars, which are in great location for offer great value. Uh, we, we're launching a lifestyle brand um, in the UK, which actually is so new, we've only just got the logo for it. So it's not on my presentation. Um, but the Sadie Hotel uh, is bright, stylish. Um, it's bringing the boutique hotel experience um, to the mid-range market. Um, we've got hotels that are in castles. We've got hotels that are in cottages um, and everything in between. It's really, really beautiful. I've added here some pictures of, of the sort of accommodations that we have. You know, we've got bedrooms, we've got bathrooms and bars that are all individual, all beautiful and all part of our members. Um, and it's it's incredibly interesting at the moment to see what everyone's doing to diversify. Um, if I can just escape that. And that. And what I would say to anyone that's uh, that's coming into the industry at the moment is to really, really take the opportunity to to assess where you want to go. I have made some full steps, um, 
and I've made some some you know some moments where I thought oh, do you know what I'm really not sure this project's going to be what I want to do um but follow your heart and and follow your passions because there are incredible opportunities out there and um, it is really really challenging at the moment and um, it is going to be an incredible next 12 months and um, to see what happens but um build your network you can never start doing that too early build your network um, hang on to those contact details, reach out on LinkedIn. And when I say reach out, this is my pet hate. When I say reach out, don't just fling out LinkedIn requests left, right and centre. Put a note in, say, this is where you know me from. I saw you at, um, I didn't get a chance to speak to you, but I would love to know you. Um, because the people that you will meet through programmes like IT ITT, Future You, um, through your, you know, through your academic institutions and through your lecturers, are amazing um, you will get insight from all over the world um, from all over the country from all parts of the industry so if there's something that you that really sparks your interest then grab hold of it learn about it um, and and all I can say now is is ask loads of questions um, take part in the debates enjoy the rest of the day um, and yeah, welcome to, to Future You because it's a brilliant programme that will really get you off to a flying start. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You I'm, I'm going to do that because you can't hear everyone else doing it. <laughs> Thank you. So um, I couldn't agree more then about LinkedIn. It's a, it's a pet peeve of mine as well. Um, you know, I know that if people link in with you on the phone, sometimes you don't have the opportunity to add a message, but you can still go back in and add a message. So, you know, we do meet an awful lot of people, particularly at big shows and conferences and things like that. So sometimes you just, we need a little bit of an aid memoir as well, just to remind us where we met people. And, and you're quite right, people in this industry are incredibly generous with their time. And if you do reach out to them, and and network with them you will get something back from them i promise you and future you is just one way of doing that and and networking is something that i'm sure you'll hear from all of our speakers um that is is so critical in our industry and i think one of the the really challenging things we have at the moment is networking online we're not out there meeting people face to face we're not out there having those sort of very personal more personal conversations that you have when you are in per when you are together um rather than online so that is a challenge in itself and I think that's certainly one of the skills that that a lot of people young people and people like myself are having to learn at the moment is how we can communicate effectively and network effectively online through channels like Microsoft Teams that we're on today um, and and also um, things like Zoom which obviously have become part of the of the language now haven't they so Ben are you going to be able to join us for Q&A later uh, if we if we are running to time, um, I am hoping to be able to join you for Q and A. Um, if I'm not able to, um, again, um, trying to, just trying to place business at the moment, um, and because I'm working flexi furlough, so it's three days a week. It's trying to fit a whole week into into three days. Um, but if I am um, if I'm not able to. Please reach out on LinkedIn and um, submit your questions through Claire. Um, also, your tutors have my email address. Um, so if there's anything burning, absolutely. But um, yeah, uh, I'm absolutely available, more than more than willing to to help. Um, so if I can't get back for for Q and A later, um, then please do just you know submit your questions. Um, it's always always good to hear from you. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you. Ben always a, an absolute star when you do these things and you're a star anyway in my eyes so thank you